You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. You ready for the Word of God? Following Jesus is obeying what He's asked us to do. I want us to turn in the Bible to a couple of Scriptures first. And then we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to minister the Word of God to you. It's great to be back in sunny Victoria. The temperature, I, a friend of mine from England rang me last night and I said, oh, today is going to be, apparently in England they're having a heat wave of 35 degrees and poor old palms are fainting everywhere. Um, and I said, look, it's going to be 12 degrees today. And he said, well, that's... Uh, that's sunbathing weather here, <laughs> 12 degrees. I thought, Lord Jesus, help us. Luke chapter, chapter 24 and verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, the Holy Spirit, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endured with power from on high. The Amplified says, clothed and fully equipped. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This morning, I want to speak on the subject that is so important in in today's uh, world. So important to us as Christians, even if I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit, I still need a refresher course on this incredible, powerful subject. Let's just pray. Father, we just want to thank You for Your goodness, Your mercy and Your love and Your grace. Thank You, Father God, that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a gift given by You, sent by Jesus and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray that You'll give each one of us listening ears and understanding hearts. I pray, Father God, the Word of God will generate faith in our hearts to receive, to be open, to receive what You have for us this morning in Jesus' precious Name. You know, the Bible says in the book of uh, Joel, God says, I will restore. He is restoring to the church the power of the supernatural through the mighty Holy Spirit. I've been in numbers of places now around the world. In Adelaide, I preached in a couple of churches. And um, again, there's a hunger that's beginning to rise up in the hearts and lives of God's people. There's a hungering and a thirsting after the things of God. There's awakening for the things of the Holy Spirit. You see, church, we live, we need a blazing revival for a burning world. We need Christians on fire for a world that's on fire. And we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. The imperative need of the hour is for Spirit-filled Christians. The missing element in many of Christians' lives today is the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, a few years ago in Life magazine, there was an article or a picture of a straw, a fragile straw, that had penetrated a light pole. How can a fragile straw penetrate a light pole? It was during a tornado where the winds caught that straw and hurled that straw against that light pole and embedded itself in that that light pole. Well, let me say to you that Christ has promised us power far greater than that. He has promised us in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall receive power. The word of power means ability, efficiency, might. I don't know about you, but I need God's ability in my life. I need to learn to operate in the ability that God has given to us. I need His ability to do the things that He has asked me and called me to do. The next thing is sufficiency. That means there's no lack Aren't you glad there's no lack in the things of God? In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that to you always having all sufficiency in all things. 
may have an abundance for every good work. No lack. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is given to us so they operate with no lack. The third uh, meaning of the word uh, power is might. It means to have dominion. It means to have authority to see miracles take place in your life and in your ministry. Late in the uh, 19th century, a Swedish chemist, an engineer named Alfred Bernhard Noble, he made a discovery that made him a fortune. He discovered a power that was stronger than anything that was known at that particular time. And he asked his friend who was a Greek scholar, he said, what's the, what's the Greek word for the explosive power? And this Greek scholar said to him, it's dunamis. He said, that's it. I'll call my new discovery dunamis. This is where we get the word dynamite from. But you see, there are 23 Hebrew and Greek words for power, in, translated power in the Bible. And the one that Jesus uses here in Acts 1.8 is the explosive power of the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit church is not a denomination. It's an experience. It's a life transforming experience that God desires that every born again Christian should receive. He wants us to receive this wonderful gift. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 14 and 17. I think it may be on the screen as well. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that. The, Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this is that. Spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. You see, church, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is especially for those that are living in the last days. If you're living in the last days, then this, is, this experience is for you. It's God's ability. It's God's power. It's God's strength and might upon your life for these last days. And it's important to know that we are saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible tells us that in addition there is also a baptism. See, when the Holy Spirit, when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you in regeneration. But when you're baptised in the Holy Spirit, He comes upon you for service, to give you power for service. In Acts 1.4, Jesus commanded His disciples to remain in the city of Jerusalem until they receive the promised gift of the Father. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the promised gift of the Father. The great apostles, these inner circle, friends of Jesus spent time with Him, fellowship with Him, knew Him intimately, had seen Him do mighty works. They were baptised in water. They heard Him preach. They heard Him teach. They saw the miracles that He performed. They still needed to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. You know, the sad fact today, church, is this, that people have made the baptism in the Holy Spirit the goal and not the gateway. I've arrived. A goal. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a goal. It's a gateway. What, what is a goal? It's a finishing line. When you run a race, you come to the finishing line. You don't keep running around, you stop. You've completed the race. There's nothing else to do. The race is finished and there's no more to achieve. You know, a song we used to sing many years ago. I'm on my way to heaven. I shall not be moved. Who remembers that song? Don't put a full stop there. As many Christians do. They say, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm saved. I'm going into I'm, I'm, In fact, I'm waiting at the Rapture bus stop. I'm okay. I'm ready to go. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for a purpose. It's for a task. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a goal, but a gateway. It's not a goal that one arrives at. You know, I've got it. 
I remember the guy that um, actually spoke to me when I was relatively young, spoke to me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And at first I, because of my denomination, I shied away from it, didn't want to have anything to do with it. But he kept on sharing me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you know, when I had actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he says, you've got it now. That's it. You've got it. I thought, got what? It's not a goal. It's a gateway. A gateway is an entrance, an access into something greater. A gateway is a place where city fathers conduct their business affairs. A gateway is a place where kings meet to plan strategies to defeat the enemy. A gateway is a place where proclamations and celebrations are held. Listen, you control the gateway, you control the city. What do you think we're called gateway church for? We want to control the city, not in a bad way, but with authority, prevent the things that the enemy wants to bring into the city. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a gateway to an ongoing growth and development in your Christian life. The purpose is to enhance your walk of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to speak to those that have already been baptised in the Holy Spirit. This is not for the, just for those who hadn't been, but for those who have been baptised. That God wants to challenge you to fill you afresh with the power of His presence. That your walk of relationship of intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ grows from day to day. It opens the Word of God to you. Suddenly you see things you hadn't seen before in the Word of God. Suddenly things become fresh to you. I hadn't seen that before. I've read that passage over and over again. I can see it in a new light now. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is to strengthen and empower in your prayer life. I remember, for instance, when Glennis was baptised in the Holy Spirit, she got it before me and so I was really grumpy and annoyed with God. I said, I read the Bible more than she does. I said, I've, I've walked with you far longer than you, she has. And if, there was silence in heaven for, heart, for, for about six months until God brought me to a place of where I was humble before God. I remember she, uh, her going to a prayer meeting. They used to sit around in a circle in a prayer meeting. Each one took their turn. And when she's prayed, the, the, the women around her said, you're different. What's happened to you? You're praying as if you really know who you're praying to. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit will enhance your prayer life because you're not praying nebulous prayers. You're praying because out of relationship with God. And God wants us to come into that understanding that the baptism of the Holy Spirit will enhance your walk in relationship with God. It'll, it'll develop your prayer life. It'll strengthen your prayer life. It also is given so that we become witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive in us. How are the world going to see Jesus unless they see Jesus in us? I remember, for instance, at work uh, when I was, I was in the printing trade, and I would continue to ask people, some of the guys to come to the church and, you know, many of them just didn't want to come. One, guy, one day this guy said, OK, I'll come. I said, if you come, you'll see Jesus. So he came along. And uh, he said, where's Jesus? I said, he's here. I said, he said, I can't see him. I said, see the people. This is his body. He didn't get it. But I made a good statement. <laughs> Listen, church, if this experience was good enough for Peter, James and John, if this experience was good enough for the Apostle Paul who wrote half of the New Testament, then why not you? In Acts 19, 1 to 2, Paul found some disciples at Ephesus who lacked the knowledge of the Holy Spirit like many today. And he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Another translation says, after you believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Paul had no doubts about their genuineness, the fact that they were disciples. But the apostle realised that something was missing in their lives. 
I remember in the early 70s, I knew there was something missing in my life. I was saved, baptised in water, saved when I was seven seven years of age, baptised in water. But when I started to hear about the the importance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I knew there was something missing in my life. And if you're sensing that this morning, then I've got good news for you. The baptizer is here this morning. You know, people say, well, what about, what about the, the tongues thing, this tongues business? Someone said to me, do you speak with tongues? I said, what else can you speak with? Someone said, oh, look, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want tongues. I said, what happens when you go to a shoe store? I want the pair of shoes over there, but cut the tongues out first. It comes with a package. It's part of the package. And you'll see later the importance of it. Speaking in tongues is the language of heaven. Do you want to speak a language of heaven? It's the Holy Spirit's gift to you. The Father's gift is the baptism and the Holy Spirit to you is the speaking in tongues. It's it's a language that's unknown to you. Given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's just worship the Holy Spirit for a moment. Let's just thank Him. Holy Spirit, we just want to thank You that You have been called to us, that You dwell in our hearts, that You love us, that Your heart's desire is to make us more like Christ. Holy Spirit, we honour You. We honour You and respect You today. We give You thanks for making Jesus Christ real to us. But why speak in tongues? I remember Glenna's dad said, look, English is enough for me. Why speak in tongues? Jesus endorsed it. Jesus, our Saviour, our Lord, the one who died on the, the one we sang about this morning. He endorsed speaking in tongues in Mark 16, 7. He says, these signs shall follow those believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Can I just say something here for a moment? That's going to happen more and more. It's going to happen. We're going to start seeing it more and more. Demons cannot stand the presence of God. When the presence of God becomes so real in the house of God, so it becomes so real in your life, you'll be amazed how those demons just want to get out. Get away. And we're going to see that more. In my name... They will cast out demons. They will speak. This is Jesus saying it. They will speak with new tongues. Jesus said it. You will speak with new tongues. Secondly, when you speak in tongues, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 2, for he who speaks in tongues does not speak unto men, but unto God. Church, you're speaking to God, the great creator of heaven and earth, the father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're speaking directly to God, your father. You know, I just Google, I said, how many stars in the Milky Way? And it says a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. And then it said that um, with the new telescopes that they have today, there's something like, Two trillion galaxies. Two trillion. You start counting two tr- uh, up to two trillion, you'll never get there. Two trillion galaxies with millions and millions of stars. Listen, God, your Father, knows every star by name. Isn't that amazing? You're talking to Him. You have the privilege to speak to Him in the language of heaven, the gift of the Holy Spirit that's been given to you, that you can speak to your heavenly Father. You're speaking to God. Thirdly, you speak mysteries. For he who speaks in tongues doth not speak unto men, but unto God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries, secret things, divine truths. You see, first, when I pray in tongues, 
I'm speaking mysteries about God, who He is, how He feels, what He is like. Your understanding starts to grow of who God is, your loving Heavenly Father, the great I Am. Secondly, when I pray in the Spirit, I'm speaking mysteries about myself. Who am I? In Christ, as He is, so am I in this world. When you speak in tongues, God begins to reveal to you who you are in Christ. The power and the authority that He has given you. What He has purposed and planned for your life. You see, when I speak in tongues, I'm actually prophesying my divine destiny. Thirdly, when I pray in tongues, I speak mysteries about His plans. What's on your heart, God? The things that, that's burning in His heart, His thoughts and His purposes, the new things that He's releasing today, the issues that He is addressing. Jesus said in John 5, 19, I only do the things that I see the Father doing. If we're going to come into that realm of walk of relationship, then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is there to enhance my walk of relationship so that I can see what He is doing. And what He does, I do likewise. Fourthly, when I pray in the Spirit, I'm speaking mysteries about people that are in need. How many of us have prayed in tongues and suddenly someone's, th someone's name come to mind? I'm sure you've had that. And so what do you do? Do you dismiss it? Glennis and I, we planned, I don't know if we made a vow, but we planned that if, if God brings to our attention any person, immediately we'd either ring them up or we would pray for them on the spot. And so we would agree together and we start praying for that person. Because when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings you the needs of people that come to your mind. Many times when I'm praying in the Spirit, I find myself thinking of that person, praying for that person. So now if the Lord brings someone to your mind when you're praying in tongues, begin to intercede for them. Ring them up. Ask the Holy Spirit, how can I bless this person? Speaking in tongues has prepared my spirit to minister to that person. And so what happens? I'm filled with faith for that moment that I can meet, meet that person's need and speak powerfully in that person's life. You see, church, for many years, you and I, I'm sure you have as well, been gradually learning to partner with the Holy Spirit in releasing what He has deposited in our hearts. How many of us have often said, God, I want to be sensitive to you. What's on your mind? What are you saying to this person? What is this person going through? I was on the plane flying into Singapore. And you know, you have about 20 minutes before you land. And as we're playing, the, the uh, attendant uh, took her seat and she was sitting opposite me. The lady next to me, she was uh, half asleep because she had drunk too much on the way. And it wasn't Coke. And... Uh, the Holy Spirit said to me, tell this woman that uh, everything is all right with her daughter. I've got her under my protection. So I said to her, I said, uh, I've just been praying for you. She said, really? I said, uh, the Holy Spirit just said to me, or I just said, God, just in case you didn't know who I was speaking about. I said, God said to me that not to worry about your daughter that he's got everything under control and that he's protecting her. And what it, what it was, she was concerned about, her, I think she, the daughter was about 15, 16 years of age. She left home and she, as she flies overseas and she gets concerned about her. And soon as I said that, she said, are you a prophet? I said, close enough. <laughs> I said, I just, want, I, I'm, I just want to tell you what God has just said. And then I began to share with her about what it means to be a Christian. And I said, uh, in fact, I invited her to come to church. She hasn't come yet. She might be here today. 
Put up your hand if you're that person. No. <laughs> See, the Holy Spirit will always, when you pray in tongues, he'll put you, the, his concerns on your heart for others because he wants you to be a blessing. He wants you to be a blessing to those around you. For many years, this has been my heart's desire, 43 years this year, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul was gripped with the mysteries of God. His letters to the churches were filled with revelation concerning these mysteries. In Romans, Paul said that he, that he does not want the believers to be ignorant of the mysteries of God's plan. In other words, Paul was saying, Paul believed that it was the inheritance of every Christian to know and understand the mysteries of God. When you pray in tongues, you're speaking mysteries that God will eventually reveal to you what they are. He did not want a single, uh, he did not want a single believer to be ignorant of the deep things that God has in store for you and I. We are speaking in heavenly things that our minds do not understand, church. But as we pray in the Spirit, God releases these into our spirits that we can act upon them. Hallelujah. Not just to reveal to us, but to act upon it. You know, again, flying to Indonesia, a guy sitting next to me. You know, it's, it's amazing in an airplane, so it's not too, you can't go very far, can you? You've got to stay where you are. Or you can get up and walk down the aisle. And we eventually got, he was an Indonesian guy, and he eventually started talking about the Lord, and I found out he was a Christian. So I said, are you baptised in the Holy Spirit? He said, no. He said, I said, do you understand what it means? I said, no. She said, no. I said, would you like to know? I said, yes. So I shared with him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I said, would you like to receive? He said, yes, I'd love to. So in the plane, we began to pray and I said, uh, let, let's, let's just speak in tongues again. And so both of us are having a glory time, 33,000 feet in the air, praising and worshipping God in the language of heaven. He received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the speaking of the language of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are speaking heavenly things. Our minds can't, can't comprehend but our spirit becomes awakened to it. And our spirit, can I say this? There is a highway between my spirit and my mind. And that highway can be cluttered by doubt, unbelief, fear, worry, sin, whatever the case may be. And sometimes my spirit wants to bring to my mind intuition, bring inner tuition to my mind, what the Holy Spirit has revealed to my mind, but it's blocked. But you know, the amazing thing about the grace of God, He can remove those blockages so there's a clear highway between my spirit and my mind so I can pick up what the Holy Spirit is saying. He wants you to be able to pick up your mind to pick up what He's saying to your spirit. Fourthly, when you speak in tongues, the Bible says this. And I want to talk about it for a minute. In 1 Corinthians 14, 4, it says, yeah, when you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. Edify means to encourage, exhort, strengthen, comfort and so on. But the, the actual word means to house build. You're building a house. This is the temple of God and you're building the house of God to become strong so He can inhabit a strong house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you think of the word edify, don't just think of encouragement. The Greek word, oikonomo, which means to build a house. The Bible says when you pray in tongues, you build the house of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit dwells because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But you know, that word edify also means to repair. You realise sometimes the way we think can damage the house. If it's a negative thought, a fearful thought, if it's an unwholesome thought, if it's a critical thought, if it's a thought of unbelief, of doubt, inferiority. The Holy Spirit gave me the early this morning. He said inferiority. If I feel inferior to people around me, that is an attack of the enemy and that can damage the house of God. 
And so speaking in tongues repairs those areas of my life that the enemy tries to damage. I need repairing every day. I need this house to be repaired. I want the Holy Spirit to dwell in a house that's not being eaten by white ants, by thoughts. I don't want to be a POW. You know what a POW is? Prison of words. And some of you have been prisoners of words. God doesn't want you to be a prisoner of words. He wants you to be a dispenser of the word of truth in people's hearts and people's lives. In 1 Corinthians 14, 4, it says, He who speaks in tongues edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. You can't edify the church, Jesus' body, unless this body is edified. This body has to be edified and built up. You can't build God's house, the church, unless your house is built up. I don't believe you can prophesy into a church or prophesy into a person's life unless your house is built up. Can you imagine someone comes to you? Pastor Phil, I'm just so depressed. And you're thinking, you're thinking in your mind, you think, well, I'm just as depressed as you. What do you want? Oh, could you pray for me? Could you cheer me up? I'm as miserable as sin just like you. But when your house is built up, when you're edified, when you're strengthened on the inside, there's an authority, there's a confidence that rises up within you and you lay hands on that person and you release them from that bondage and see the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them in strength and in power. I don't believe we can prophesy into a church unless my house is being built up. Number five, speaking in tongues is a vehicle. Doesn't mean you get in the car and drive. It doesn't mean that. What I mean by that is 1 Corinthians 14, 14 6 is if, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you? Just imagine if for the last 20 minutes I'd been speaking in tongues to you, you'd, you'd be looking at each other and thinking, what's going on? You'd be saying to Pastor Grant, who invited this guy? When's he going to India? Um, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you? Nothing, unless. There's a word that says unless. Is it on there? Have we got it on the screen? Unless. I want to show you this. If I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you? Unless I speak to your way of revelation, knowledge, prophecy and instruction, teaching or instruction. In other words, speaking in tongues brings you into the river where revelation flows, knowledge flows, instruction flows. Prophecy flows. You know, the Bible says in, uh, in Proverbs 21, verse 1, the king's heart in the hands of the Lord is like rivers of water. He directs the river wherever it's needed. The king's heart, that's you and I, in the hands of the Lord. There's someone down here that's discouraged. The king's heart in the hands of the Lord is like rivers of water and he directs a river of encouragement to that person, a river, a river of in prophecy to that person. Can you see the incredible benefit of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receiving the gift from the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues? Number six, pre speak, praying in tongues increases sensitivity. I cannot overemphasize this. When you speak in tongues, in fact, let's read from uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, this is from the Amplified, uh, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me. The Holy Spirit has joined Himself to my spirit. My spirit has become so attached to the Holy Spirit. Your spirit has become so attached to the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit wants your spirit to become so sensitive to His beck and call, sensitive to what He wants to do. There are times when you only feel, you can sense a, just the breath of God. And as we walk with the Holy Spirit, talk with Him, fellowship with Him and pray in the Spirit, it's amazing how your spirit demand, your spirit man becomes so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Number seven, praying in the Spirit brings rest and refreshing. 
This is a powerful one for today, church. We're living in a stressful society. We're living in a society where people are stressed out to the max. And in Isaiah 28 verses 11 and 12, it says, With stammering lips and another tongue, He will speak to this people, to whom He said, This is the rest, which, um, rest with which you may cause the weary to... Are you weary today? There's a rest for you. Weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. There is a rest and a refreshing in praying in the Spirit. You know, when, when you see distance runners, they run along and the people on the side clap them and then the people would rush out and give them a bottle of water. Often they just pour the water on themselves over their heads to refresh them so they can continue on in the race. There are times when we need to just pour out the refreshing upon us afresh. How do you do that? Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the language of heaven. God wants you to live a refreshed life. He wants you to live a restful life, not a stressful life. There's a difference between stress and rest. There's a difference between refreshing and being dry. I need to be refreshed daily. And I pray that you will respond this, uh, after the, for the altar call. Those that have been baptised, I need a refreshing. I need a fresh refreshing. I need my spirit to learn to rest in Him, in Jesus' name. You know, Frank Houston, Brian Houston's father, he grew up in the Salvation Army and he, uh, he had problems with uh, de depression. And so when he was baptised in the Holy Spirit, God spoke to him about speaking in tongues. It'll bring a rest and refreshing to him. So every day he would constantly, during his daily activity in his, in his work before he became in the ministry, he'd just pray in tongues, pray in tongues. And he felt that heaviness, depression lift and then come on again, lift and then takes a while before it came back on again, lifting them a longer time. And then suddenly he realises that he was, he was just operating and, and living a life that was pleasing to God, restful and refreshed in God. You can receive that today. You can receive rest and refreshing in the things of God. Number eight, these are only part of it. These are only some of the things. I'm only giving you eight. Praying in tongues is a weapon. That's not on your uh, screen there, but it's a weapon of warfare. In Ephesians 6, 17 to 18, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the Word of, this is the sword of the Spirit. And then it says here, sword is, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful. Praying in the Spirit causes you to be watchful. In other words, causes you to be alert. To this end, with all perseverance, praying in the Spirit causes you to have perseverance, to hang in there, not give up. And supplication with all the saints. Praying in the Spirit. Paul speaks about in, in Ephesians 6 about the, the armour of God. Put on the armour of God. Have your foot, feet shod with the gospel of preparation of the gospel of peace and so on. And then he says, pray at all times in the Spirit. One of the great ways of praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues. It's a part of your weapon. I was speaking to Pastor Derek. He's the pastor at Horsham. He's the one that says, uh, uh, needs our prayers. He's got cancer. Um, and he goes for a big operation tomorrow. But he said, I, was, he, I only rang him up last week and he said, I was praying in the Spirit. <clears throat> and suddenly as I was praying, my, my, my language changed into warfare. I knew that I was touching something fresh in God. And he said, uh, I suddenly became aware of demonic activity trying to, trying to hold me down, trying to control me, trying to put this disease upon my life. And so I had to break through in it in Jesus' name. Praying in the Spirit is a weapon of warfare that you and I can use. And we should use it. We need to use it in our day and age. You know, why did God choose tongues? Why couldn't have choose something, you know, get your ears to wiggle or something, your nostrils to flare, something different, hair to stand on end. Why did he use tongues? Well, Dr. David Yonggi Cho asked the neurosurgeon this question. And he explained it like this. He said, God's purpose in having Christians speak in tongues, he said, he points out the speech centre, which is here, dominates the brain. 
God's Spirit therefore must regulate the faculty of speech in order to have full control of the mind, the will and the emotions. The speech centre is in the brain has total dominion over all the other nerves. What does James, James 3 says? The tongue is the least member, the least member, and yet it can rule the whole body. He went on to say the speech nerve centre has such power over all of the body that simply speaking can give one control over his body to manipulate it in the way that he wishes. He said, if someone keeps saying, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm hopeless, I'm weak, I'm weak, eventually the other nerve says, said, let's, let's, let's follow the commands. Let's be obedient to the commands that have been given. And so those nerves in sequence fall in line in obedience to the command that's been given in natural sequence, adjust their physical attitudes to weakness. Your speech centre. That's why I say to parents, don't ever call your kids an idiot. Don't ever say things like that, negative things about your kids. And please, church, don't ever say that about yourself. Oh, gee, I'm just such an idiot. No, you're not. You're a child of God. You're made in the image of God. Don't ever say, oh, I can't afford it. Just say, well, I don't have the money right now. Change our language, church. Change our language with heavenly language. If your tongue is under the control of the Holy Spirit, then I believe your body is also under the control of the Holy Spirit. If I was to say to you this morning, are you full of the Holy Spirit? Yes, I speak in tongues. You know, you can speak in tongues and not be full of the Holy Spirit. The word full of the Holy Spirit means coming under the control of the Holy Spirit. I want to come under the control. I want the church to constantly stay in that 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 state of being under the control of the Holy Spirit. I want you as Christians be in that state constantly of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let me just finish with a couple of things. In the Second World War, during the Pacific War, particularly in the Pacific, Pacific Iwo Jima, uh, the United States were in serious trouble because uh, the Japanese were able to break through their codes their secret codes. Because many of the Japanese were educated in America, so they understood the American lingo and the slang and so on. And so they, they, they were able to break through the, the code and they were constantly uh, at the pass before the Americans got there. They knew what to do. And they were just uh, defeating the American army, uh, Navy at that time. A guy by the name of Philip, Philip always comes up with ideas. Anyone with the name of Philip, you know what I mean. Where is he? Over here. Where's the other Philip? He's over here. We always seem to come up with ideas. If you want to know anything, ask Philips. <laughs> ask the Philips in the church. Anyways, Philip Johnson, he was, uh, his parents were missionaries with the Navajo uh, Indians. And so he was brought up in that, in that uh, compound and he understood the language. He learned that language from knee high. And it's the most difficult language that you could ever learn. You can't, it's not even written. It's not a written language. And so he came up with this bright idea. He said, why don't we use the Indian language, this Navajo Indian language, uh, and use that as a code, work out a code system. So they did that. And from that moment on, the Japanese were never able to break through in that code. Here's the story. You have a code that the devil cannot break through on. You have a language that the devil cannot uh, decipher, cannot break through. It's the language of heaven. It's the language given as a gift by the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit's already in you. Not when you get baptised in the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you. And so I just want to finish up with... Um, uh, put, if we can put that verse on the uh, screen, John chapter 7. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out. There's three things, four things we need to do. He said, if anyone is thirsty, if you've never been baptised in the Holy Spirit, the first thing is thirst. If anyone is thirsty, it's important that you're thirsty. You know, one of the things, one of the, 
blockages that, that hold people back is fear. Fear was the, was the thing that held me back. What happens if I got on the bus and I blurted out in tongues? A lot of rubbish. You have control over it. This language. And God has not given to you a spirit of fear. But you see, there came a day where my hunger became greater than my fear. So I said, God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The thirst started to rise up in me, thirsting for God, thirsting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The second thing I need to do is come. Let Him come unto Can we leave that on there? Thanks. Let Him come unto me. Come, follow me. He said, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said out of His heart, just before that. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come. Let him come unto me, unto Jesus. You know, I've learned the secret concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not the baptizer, but I know who is. And this morning, He wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've never received the, the language of heaven, the gift from the Holy Spirit, then this morning you can receive that. Anyone, let him come unto me and drink. If, any, if anyone believes in me, out of his innermost being, out of your belly. I like the old King James Version. Out of your belly. I know where my belly is. Innermost being could be anywhere, but out of my inner, out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake, spoke of the Holy Spirit. So thirsty, you come to Jesus, you drink. How do I drink? This is the, this is the, this is the amazing thing. In the things of the Spirit, we have very little understanding how to respond, how to position ourselves. Well, I'm going to show you how to position yourself to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. So you've got to drink. So how do I drink? How do I drink of the Spirit? Notice what happens when the cup comes to my mouth. Can you see something happen there? Let me do it again. I'm not in the circus. I'm not going to, uh, you can throw a ball in the mouth. Okay, and open my mouth and I drink. How do I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I come to Jesus and drink. I simply breathe in. I physically breathe in. We do it every day. Guess what happens if you didn't breathe? Pastor Grant would have to raise you from the dead. You know, you drink. I receive in Jesus' name. And as you breathe out, you turn the tap on. You offer your mouth. You just open your mouth and be, you breathe out. And you move your tongue. You just, you just offer your vocal organs to the Holy Spirit. There's a river that's already inside of you. It's ready to come out. That river is about to flow. But it needs the tap to turn it on. And the tap is my mouth. Before I pray for you this morning, I want you to close your eyes, every head bowed. The Apostle Paul said, made these words in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. He said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, if you've never responded to Him, you've never invited Him, or maybe you had done it many years ago, but you know that you're not following the Lord closely as you, should, as you would like to. But this morning, you want to follow Jesus closer than you've ever done before. If you've never given your life to Jesus, Jesus said, the Apostle Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to pray a prayer. It's the most important prayer that I can ever pray for you. And I want you to be included in this prayer. If you'd like to be included in this prayer, I want you just to raise your hands. Pastor Phil, I want to receive Jesus today. Anyone? Just quickly put your hand up, put it down. Let me see. One person has, thank you. Anyone else? Another person has, thank you. I can I see that hand. Anyone else? If you've never given given your heart to the Lord before. You've never received Jesus Christ. Church, I want you to, could you follow me as we say this prayer together? And those people that raise their hands, why don't you say this prayer after me as well? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. 
I believe that you died for me particularly. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I truly repent of my sins. I'm sorry, Lord. Wash me with your precious blood. I open the door of my heart. I invite you into my life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be Lord of my life. From this moment on, I want to live my life for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If those two that have put their hand up, if you can see Pastor Grant afterwards, Pastor Grant's here. Uh, he will have a quick talk to you before you go. Okay, thank you. I want to pray for people that have already been baptized, but I sense the Holy Spirit wants to bring refreshing to you. Can I say this? Don't shoot me down when I say this. But unless you're not moving in the gifts of the Spirit, unless you're operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, then you need to be at the front. You need to receive. Unless you're seeing the demonstration of power in your life, don't put on any religious garb. Just say, God, I'm thirsty. God, I need, I need the power of the Holy Spirit to operate again in my life.